Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, friends and colleagues from across the world. Uh, thank you for joining us for the 45th and final day of the 2020 peer-to-peer -peer Global Dental Interdisciplinary Summit. Uh, today we have two special guests uh, uh, in our uh, final uh, webinar. Um, Dr. Audrey Boris and Dr. Kevan Javid, who will be hosting the session, one of our regents. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Hi, thank you for having us. Yes, it's quite an honor. And uh, I must say that uh, you are one of the last specializations that we did not have uh, in our multidisciplinary approach from the entire spectrum of the, of the uh, different disciplines. And uh, uh, pathology, which is a very important topic, and Dr. Javid will uh, uh, inform us a little bit more formally on your bio. Uh, all of you uh, that have tuned in in the last few uh, weeks, in the last six weeks, and have listened to the lectures, um, thank you for uh, joining us in this uh, monumental effort. We reached over two million peers last night uh, and uh, uh, achieved the unachievable together in writing mm -hmm. history and in bringing information and knowledge to our colleagues from the most distant places. Uh, with that said, uh, Dr. Javid, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, well, friends and colleagues, uh, thank you and uh, welcome to, uh, I would say, one of the more exciting uh, mm -hmm. topics uh, uh, of our seminars today, you know, oral pathology, mm -hmm. I find very exciting. Um, um, you know, a lot of times we tend to uh, overlook and, uh, um, you know, I know Dr. Boris on a personal note, uh, we, um, uh, Dr. Boris has one of the most successful um, pathology labs in Los Angeles. So I, uh, we've been using the, the services for, for, for decades. Uh, and I know any other prof any, many, many other professionals who've been using her services. Uh, so Dr. Boris, uh, uh, thank you. Also, Dr. Boris is very active. Uh, and Dr. Shah is sharing our, um, um, our this is the latest, uh, one, of, uh, one of the latest articles we had. Uh, I'm really proud of this. Uh, it was uh, published in Compendium. Uh, thank you, Dr. Boris, for all the hard work, and we really appreciate that. So, Dr. Boris, uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, basically uh, introduce you, Dr. Boris. Uh, thank, thank, thank you for uh, taking our invitation and, and doing for us. We really appreciate that. Of course. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Boris. So, Dr. Audrey Boris graduated from McGill University with a Bachelor of Science in Anatomy and cell biology. She continued her studies at Queen's University, earning a Master of Science in Pathology and Molecular Medicine. She received her Doctor of Dental Surgery from the uh, University of Southern California, USC School of Dentistry. Following graduation, Dr. Boris uh, pursued her interest in oral maxillofacial pathology at New York uh, Presbyterian Queen's and then she's a diplomat of an American Board of Oral Maxillofacial Pathology, a fellow of the American Academy of Oral Maxillofacial Pathology. She's a, the laboratory director and the president um, of Oral Pathology Associate in, in Los Angeles and uh, practices cl uh, clinical oral pathology in Santa Monica. Um, as an assistant professor at USC Austria School of Dentistry, she directs and instructs both pre-doctoral and post-doctoral courses in oral pathology. In her spare time, Dr. Boris enjoys maintaining an active lifestyle, being outdoors and spending time with their family and friends. And, uh, and we know you're taking time from your, uh, your family and friends, so we really appreciate Dr. Uh, Boris. Uh, so thank you. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And um, yeah, we, wish, we will get started then. So I'll go ahead. Thank you. And, yeah. And share my screen. Okay. So today's topic is 
we're going to start kind of slowly. We're going to, the topic is learning the basics through cases. So we're going to talk a little bit about approaches to identifying and describing lesions, coming up with differential diagnoses, which is really important um, to have an idea of what you're looking at uh, when you, you know see an abnormality in the mouth, because that helps you communicate with other clinicians, with the patient, and then also helps um, you know, guide your approach to the lesion. So we'll learn a little bit about that, and then going, I'm going to give you examples of um, interesting cases that, in some uh, instances, have mimicked more basic um, lesions. And so it'll be it'll be a nice kind of tying everything together. Um, okay, so first steps is we have to obviously be able to recognize abnormal as dentists and, you know, specialists. We're so focused on our specific areas uh, in the mouth. Sometimes we forget to look and um, remember that, you know, there's more than teeth in the mouth. Uh, so we want to make sure that we do our oral, you know, screening exams on every patient, um, you know, at least every six months. If possible, you know, when you see the patient on a regular basis. Um, so recognizing abnormal is the first step. Um, then describing the lesion and uh, generating a differential diagnosis. So that's kind of the things that we're going to focus on. Uh, definitive diagnostic procedures, mostly in the oral cavity, we're dealing with scalpel and punch biopsies. And then, um, you know, depending on the diagnosis, that will dictate the treatment. And uh, clinical follow-up is also very important. So talking now a little bit more specifically about describing the lesion, things that we uh, want to consider when we're looking at lesions and, and describing lesions are the location. Basically, what we're trying to do is describe a lesion to somebody, say, that's not, you know, that's a way, you know, you're talking to somebody over the phone and they, you need to be able to describe to them, you know, uh, a good example of what you're seeing. So, you know, they have, they have their eyes closed and they can picture exactly what you are seeing. So location is very important. Color, size of the lesion, the shape, the texture of the surface, that helps dictate um, a little bit down the line when you're coming up with a differential diagnosis, um, you know, where you think the lesion might be coming from. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The consistency of the lesion, is it doughy? If it's doughy, potentially in yellow, we might think of something like a lipoma. Um, and then the growth pattern. So those are all things that you know you want to consider when you're looking at an abnormality in the mouth. Uh, don't forget about you know, asking the patient questions regarding the history of the condition. You know, how long has it been there? Is it associated with any symptoms? If it's painful, you know, how, what's the quality of the pain, the uh, quantity, the duration? Is there a history of trauma? And then, especially with some of the disquamative type gingivitides that we'll get into a little bit uh, later in this presentation, it's really important to include medical history and medications um, of the patients. Uh, and I'll go over a why that's so important in, in those slides. And then social history, obviously also very important, um, particularly if you're looking at a red or white lesion, you wanna make sure that you know the patient's uh, smoking history, for example, um, that would be very important. So we're just gonna go over some basic descriptors just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, so we have here pap a papule, which is defined as a solid swelling that's less than five millimeters. Um, here are a couple examples on the skin. Uh, so, and this one's on the lower lip. Uh, when you have a solid swelling that's larger than five millimeters, we call that a nodule. So here's an example, um, most probably of a, of a um, hyperplastic lingual tonsil. Uh, we can further describe le uh, nodules based on their base. So do they have a broad base? If so, we call that sessile. And here's a great example of um, a submucosal large, say, four by two centimeter um, sessile nodule of the left hard and soft palate. And then if it has a narrow base, we can call that pedunculated. So uh, something like a denture papilloma. If it's papillary, uh, it will have many surface projections. And here are some good examples of, of uh, biopsy proven papillomas. Some of them have nice long finger like projections. Others have more of a cauliflower type appearance, the soft palate being one of the more common locations. Um, An ulceration is defined as 
um, an, an area devoid of epithelium. So we have our mucosa under the microscope. I'm looking and I'm seeing stratified squamous epithelium here. And then all of a sudden we have a lack of epithelium. This is an important concept to understand because when you're taking a biopsy of lesions, you wanna know what the most representative sample will be. Um, and when you're approaching an ulceration, you want to make sure that you're including not only the ulcer, but perilesional tissue. And that's not always the case with um, biopsies. Say for example, if we back up a couple slides and we see this large sessile mass, the best place to biopsy this would be right in the center and go down as deep as you can. We don't need to see normal or surrounding tissue unless it's an ulceration or um, a vesicular bolus type disease. And that's also why it's important to have a differential diagnosis. A macule is a flat pigmented lesion. So here we have two examples of biopsy proven melanotic macules. Uh, vesicles and bulla, those are fluid filled lesions. We've got small um, vesicular lesions here and then a larger bulla here. And so this is the, you know, the basis of vesicular bullous conditions, that's why we call them that, because we're basically um, grouped into how they how they uh, look clinically. So vesicular bolus conditions, remember, include pumpagus and pumpagoid. Um, just touching on imaging, uh, remember diffuse radio uh, radiopaque. So radiopaque obviously being more um, dense than the surrounding tissue and diffuse not having very well-defined borders and covering a large area. This is uh, specifically what we call a ground glass appearance and this was fibrous dysplasia. And then remember mixed radiolucent radiopaque. So you want, when you're describing imaging, we want to include um, the type of image. This is a periapical film showing and then we wanna include the borders. So well-defined, and if it's well-defined, is it corticated? Um, and cortication usually indicates the lesion's growing a little bit slower. Uh, so well-defined, corticated, and then we go into the internal structure. So here we have a mixed radiolucent, radiopaque lesion, and then location, and then effect on surrounding structures. So those are all things we wanna describe in uh, radiographic appearance. Here we have a nice example of a radiolucency with a nice corticated border, indicating slow growth and that the body has had time to wall off that uh, expansile lesion. And this under the microscope would appear like dense bone, that white line. Multilocular, you have obviously multiple locules. Uh, and so you have a whole differential diagnosis that goes with multilocular lesions. And so now we're just gonna talk a little bit about differential diagnoses. So when we come up with a differential, I like to teach with the residents and the students, um, there's two broad categories that you have to think about. So you have to think about what is the etiology of this lesion? Uh, and then we subclassify etiology based on whether we think it's developmental. Developmental would have features like possibly most commonly presenting in a younger child, um, having multifocal areas of involvement or symmetry, bilateral type appearance. Uh, we think of things like syndromes, um, for example. So that would fall under the developmental condition. Uh, reactive, there are several subcategories in reactive. We think about traumatic, um, inflammatory, infectious, and autoimmune. And then neoplastic, black and white, benign, malignant in real life. There is a whole, you know, pathology is not black and white. There's a whole area in between benign and malignant that could be benign aggressive or low grade malignant, or even sometimes we don't even know, we don't even have a name for these things. So we have to come up with these nice descriptive diagnoses. Um, so th that's one real, really important consideration when you're thinking um, about the, your differential diagnosis. And the second one is anatomy. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about the tissue type that's present. And that's where a little bit of background in histology and pathology can come in um, useful. You know, we're all experts in the head and neck area, but think on it for this um, purpose, think on a tissue level. So say for example, you have a lesion of the lower lip um, you, you, and it's a submucosal mass. You want to think about the tissue that's in the area. So you've got fat in the area, you've got adipose tissue, you've got fibrous tissue, you've got 
uh, minor salivary glands. So all of these things are very important. And then if you think it's a, it's, it's a solitary lesion and um, is fast growing and it's ulcerated, you might think it, it's uh, more aggressive. So then you would favor a neoplastic, maybe malignant lesion, and then you can base your um, differential diagnoses off both of those things. So for example, an adenocarcinoma. So that's how I approach differential diagnoses. Um, so we're gonna get into some cases. And again, you know, this is a, a presentation where I like to um, go over some of the basics through the cases, but a lot of the times these cases, just out of for interest sake, um, tend to, these cases are gonna be a little bit um, interesting and kind of mimicking benign lesions, if you will. So let's go ahead with our first case. So um, in this instance, we're gonna cover, um, you know, red and white lesions. Uh, so here we have a 50 year old female and this case came to my lab a couple years ago and the prior cl clinician had performed a brush biopsy and this was interpreted as negative. Uh, so here we have the lesion on the la right lateral border of the tongue. It's fairly large. It's, it's not even all in, um, included in the picture. It extends even farther than the photograph. Um, we see that it's irregular surface with some red and white areas. The patient was placed on recall every six months um, because the brush biopsy came back as negative. And so, you know, they were comfortable. They, they had, I guess, in retrospect, a false sense of security with that diagnosis. Um, eventually the patient did seek another clinician's opinion and got had another biopsy. And at that point it was a scalpel biopsy. And we'll talk about why the two um, are very, it's important. Um, to follow if you are going to do a brush biopsy, which in general I don't recommend for oral lesions, um, why it's important to follow up with a scalpel biopsy, which is the standard of care. But before we get into that, I just want to touch on white lesions and red lesions. So remember a white lesion in the mouth, um, it, it, it can be defined as a leukoplakia according to the WHO. Um, if it is a white lesion that cannot be scraped off, so we're eliminating candida in that case, and cannot be diagnosed clinically as any other disease. So that's the strict definition of a leukoplakia from the World Health Organization. Um, when we say can't be diagnosed clinically as any other disease, we're kind of eliminating uh, some of the developmental and reactive conditions such as, say, white sponge nevus, which is a developmental condition, um, or sometimes lichen planus, which is a reactive condition. So a true leukoplakia um, will not be able to be diagnosed clinically as any other disease, and it's not gonna be able to wipe off. So here we have a great example um, of a leukoplakia on the gingiva, and you can see that there's kind of a, a raised area, and then a, a, it's a little bit more rough, and then a smooth area that's a little bit um, more diffuse. And so the general differential diagnosis for a white lesion is hyperkeratosis, dysplasia, and squamous cell carcinoma. Um, that's kind of my go-to differential. Remember hyperkeratosis is just too much keratin on the mucosa and you can think of it as being analogous to a callus on the skin. Um, so it's kind of a protective thing in general. Uh, epithelial dysplasia is a precursor to squamous cell carcinoma. And at this point in time in the oral pathology world, we are diagnosing these as mild, moderate, or severe. In the general pathology world, it's more low grade versus high grade. And I think we might trend towards that general direction um, in the next couple of years because it is somewhat subjective. Um, and then squamous cell carcinoma, obviously, that's what we're concerned about. Um, so we want to always catch these lesions if we can a little bit more you know, as early as possible where they're, you know, dysplastic as opposed to squamous cell because that makes a big difference as far as um, treatment for the patient. Okay, uh, sorry. Just wanted to cover uh, why white lesions look white. Uh, and I, as I said before, it's because of that thickened layer of keratin. So here we have stratified squamous epithelium. We've got um, all the individual keratinocytes and a normal amount of thickness of keratin is this area right here. Um, when you have some kind of a trauma or even sometimes um, undetermined significance, uh, you can have a thickened keratin layer. And so that's why the tissue looks white in the mouth. 
Um, red lesions, very similar differential diagnosis. Again, an erythroplakia defined by the WHO is a red lesion that cannot be attributed to any other condition clinically. Um, and so, and it doesn't wipe off. And so here's a great example of, a, of an erythroplakia. Um, and so our differential diagnosis would be something reactive. So trauma or inflammatory, it could also include um, a vascular lesions. So you've got to start thinking about why the tissue looks red. Sometimes it's inflammation, sometimes it's vascular, and other times it's because of uh, increased thinning of the epithelium, which happens a lot of the times in dis advanced dysplasia. Um, and sometimes it's a combination of all three. So our differential for erythroplakias are dysplasia, squamous cell, and something reactive. Uh, it's also important to note, uh, remember, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, that erythroplakias are usually more, if they're going to be dysplasia, they're more advanced than leukoplakias. The reason being that the more advanced the dysplasia, the less differentiated the cells are that make up that mucosa. And so they kind of, if you will, lose their ability to produce keratin, and that decreases that layer on the top and so therefore the tissue looks a little bit more red in combination with um, potentially inflammation and increased vascularity in the area. So just to, you know, I won't focus too much on histology, but just so you can get an idea, we've got mild dysplasia, um, which is abnormality in, this, in the cells and architecture of the reedy ridges um, in the lower one third of the epithelium. Um, and then moderate, we define as about the lower half, and then severe, more than two thirds, and then um, carcinoma in situ would be full thickness, but not yet broken through the basement membrane. And that's really important concept to understand because if you have carcinoma in situ, um, it's you know basically the step before cancer, but it's not able to access the connective tissue, which is underneath the epithelium, which is separated by this basement membrane. And that's really important because there's no blood vessels in the epithelium, they're only in the connective tissue and lymphatics. And so once these abnormal cells access the connective tissue, then they have access uh, potentially to the vessels um, and that can result in metastasis, which is, you know, the reason for a lot of the times the mortality associated with cancer. So this is just a descript, um, kind of more of a diagram for those that aren't too versed in histology. Uh, the diagnosis in this case, uh, so as I said, the patient um, sought a second opinion, had a biopsy, uh, a scalpel biopsy, and the diagnosis was a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so just to talk a little bit about, um, you know, brush biopsies in general, uh, you know, I don't recommend them in the oral cavity. They're great for, say, areas that are a little bit more difficult to access, like the cervix. We use them for brush, for um, pap smears. But in the oral cavity, the standard of care really is a scalpel or a punch biopsy. Um, there's just a lot of false negatives associated with um, a brush biopsy due to, you know, the way that the slide is, um, you know, uh, processed and analyzed at the labs, as well as um, user error. Uh, so you might not scrape the right area or you might not scrape enough tissue. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of steps where you could potentially have a false negative, um, which happened in this case. So the patient was followed, you know, for several months or, you know, almost a year. Um, without addressing the lesion because there was a false sense of security. So you just want to avoid that, um, obviously, for the patient's well-being. Um, so in general, scalpel biopsy, include the red and white area. Um, remember, the red is usually more advanced than the white. So this patient was diagnosed with a squamous cell. We're just going to talk a little bit about squamous cell in general. As you can see from my um, heading here, I've separated into oral cavity and oral pharyngeal, and that's really, really important. The reason being that the more you know we're learning about these two con these two diseases, the more we realize that you know even though they're squamous cell carcinomas, they're actually very separate types of squamous cell carcinomas. Um, we know that um, the oral cavity usually is uh, squamous cells are associated with smoking um, and and alcohol in combination. Um, even more so, um, betel quid in some areas of the world as well as chewing tobacco, sunlight on the lips. But then when we look at the oropharynx, that's more so associated with HPV. Um, so 
the farther back you are in the in the throat, um, in the oral cavity, the more likely it will be the squamous cell will be HPV related. The more anterior you go, the less likely. Um, so just backing up here, talking about the epidemiology um, within the United States, about 53,000 cases um, estimated per year. We still combine the data. So that's data combined um, between oral cavity and oral pharyngeal squamous cell. But I think in the next couple of years, we're, you're going to start to see the data um, start to kind of split up because we, they really are um, different types of squamous cell. And um, there's a different um, prognosis as well, which is really important. Um, so, you know, this data here is still combined. Estimated 10,000, almost 11,000 deaths per year. Males are affected almost uh, twice as commonly as females. Five-year survival rate combined is 62%. Um, and it's the eighth most common cancer in men. But like I said, if you uh, look specifically at the oral cavity versus oral pharynx, um, oral pharynx in general will have a better five-year survival rate if it is HPV related. So this is a hot topic right now. Um, again, in the States, 80 million total HPV infections, 6 million uh, new infections per year. 80% of Americans will have HPV in their lifetime. Most of us will be clearing these infections without consequence, but there are a subset that will develop um, an HPV-associated malignancy, and one-third of those, and this is rising, so head and neck squamous cell carcinomas um, are increasing uh, the ED when they're associated with um, HPV and cervical cancers that we all know are also associated with HPV are on the decline. Um, and actually this year is when um, oropharyngeal, the, the number of oropharyngeal HPV related squamous cells increased higher than the number of uh, cervical cancers related to HPV. So that's really important. Um, so HPV is a, a virus. Uh, there's many different subtypes of the virus. There is low risk and high risk, or, or non-oncogenic, meaning low risk, and high risk or oncogenic uh, subtypes. Um, and that's really important to, uh, to know because the low risks are associated with things like papillomas and condylomas, and the high risk uh, subtypes are what are associated with the squamous cell carcinomas. Um, we kind of went over this already, but just to kind of drive it home, looking at this uh, picture, we see that the oropharynx is defined, um, you know, if you strictly define it as the soft palate, the tonsillar pillar in the back of the throat, as well as the base of the tongue, 80% of squamous cells that arise in that area will be HPV associated. If you define the oral cavity as everything anterior to that, only about 2 to maybe 5% will be um, associated with HPV. Um, so our high risk sites for squamous cell carcinoma are still the same. So lateral borders of the tongue, ventral tongue, floor of mouth, soft palate tonsillar pillar, but we know that kind of the soft palate tonsillar pillar area, those would be HPV related more likely than um, the, the former area, the former locations. So just a little bit about um, oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma and HPV. Uh, we had a study here that was uh, done in 2011, which is kind of, um, you know, at the beginning of when all this was starting to come to light. Uh, this study found that not only was the incidence of oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma increasing, in this case, they found a 30% increase. But, um, you know, if you look at some of the newer studies, it's, you know, a, a lot higher increase uh, than that. Um, this was primarily in younger men and often diagnosed at late stage. Um, so they, they found the incidence was increasing, but also the proportion of HPV positive oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas was also increasing. Um, and so they basically took biopsy samples from the 1980s and analyzed them for um, HPV DNA. And then they compared that with biopsy samples from the 2000s. And so they found that in the 80s, only 16% of those um, samples were HPV positive, whereas in 2000 it was 73 percent. So there's really an increase in the proportion um, of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cells as well. So this is something that I'm sure that, you know, some of you have come across in your practice already. Um, this is a study that was uh, published in the New England Journal in 2007, one of the first studies addressing this topic. Um, and so she, Dr. D'Souza, showed that there were several really important independent risk factors. She showed that um, the increased number of vaginal or oral sex partners was associated with developing oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. 
that the presence of HPV-16, regardless of alcohol or tobacco use, was also associated with um, the disease. And that was very important because that was one of the first times that somebody was able to show that it was actually the virus and not other um, tobacco and alcohol um, uh, related uh, condition. And then engagement in casual sex at an early age um, was also uh, defined or was also an independent risk factor for developing oral uh, oral pharyngeal squamous cell. Um, and this was also very interesting. We, we heard this um, at a talk that she gave at our American Academy um, of Oral Pathology a couple years ago. Um, and she basically showed, or um, her data showed that sexual partners with a history of HPV associated cancers, um, they, sorry, they, she showed that if a patient's partner had um, a history of a HPV associated cancer, that that individual was at increased risk. Um, so for example, if the patient's um, say wife had a history of cervical cancer, then that um, the husband would have an increased risk of developing an oral pharyngeal cancer, which was really, really interesting. Um, so her data basically showed that oral HPV infections sexually acquired and that there was an association with um, oral genital contact and development of oral pharyngeal cancer. And here's a really good example of what, an, um, you know, not super advanced, but not, not early as well, um, lesion, uh, this was biopsy proven HPV associated oral pharyngeal cancer, where we see this kind of papillomatous like lesion or verrucal papillary lesion here. But if you look closely, it's probably extending um, you know, into the surrounding areas as well. So that's a that's a good example of what you might be looking for in your clinical exams. Um, I'm just gonna contrast oral versus oral pharyngeal uh, lesions in the next couple slides. So remember for oral cancers, um, same kind of demographic, older males, smokers and drinkers in general, for oral pharyngeal, it's increasing in younger males and it's HPV associated. So here we have this kind of granulomatous erythematous lesion of the oral pharynx, and that's typically what we would be looking for in um, an oral for an oral pharyngeal squamous cell that was biopsy proven. And this is something that we would, uh, you know, consider to be um, very suspicious for squamous cell in the oral cavity, and that was also biopsy proven. Here are a couple other examples. So um, non-HPV related squamous cell carcinoma, you can tell this is kind of a younger female, which is interesting. Um, and then here is kind of a middle-aged um, male with a HPV related squamous cell. So that's, these are the lesions, um, you know, try and when you're doing your exams, make sure you're not only looking um, at the at all the areas in the mouth, but make sure you're looking at the oropharynx as well. Um, when I'm practicing clinically and I even see an, a tonsillar asymmetry and there's no history of a recent upper aerodigestive tract infection, I will refer to ENT just to have the patient scoped because there are, you know, are a um, uh, couple of things on my differential diagnosis, including very early squamous cell as well as um, lymphomas that can look like tonsillar, that can appear as tonsillar asymmetry in the very early stages. Uh, here's another example. Um, this patient had an, uh, was diagnosed with having localized aggressive periodontitis. Um, the tooth was pulled and an implant was placed and the crown uh, was placed, the implant crown was placed. The clinician was thinking all along this was granulation tissue. Um, so, you know, a couple of things. You notice that the rest of the oral cavity, the hygiene looks very good. Um, so remember not to jump right away to um, you know, things that are you, you are most familiar with. If it's not quite fitting, um, make sure that you're taking a biopsy to rule out other more serious conditions. You know, 99% of the time it's gonna be um, or, you know, high, a high percentage of the time it will probably be nothing, but it is a good idea to make sure you know what you're dealing with. Um, so this is all a squamous cell carcinoma, um, and it was never periodontitis, because squamous cell can mimic periodontitis. Um, here is another example of an HPV-related biopsy-proven um, squamous cell carcinoma of the oropharynx. This is a, um, also a really great case that came to the lab. Um, here we have, I, I like to, in my 
full screen presentation. I don't have the, the all the pictures up at once. They kind of click. So you have a chance to figure out where you think this squamous cell is. Um, but it's outlined here. I, I nicely outlined it. This is squamous cell carcinoma. Um, it's masquerading as periodontal disease. So for cases like this, you're not going to jump to, oh my gosh, this is a squamous cell. Um, but you should have a high end, you know, you should start to think about maybe out, think outside the box when you're scaling, root planing, um, you know, uh, treating this as periodontal disease, but it doesn't resolve. That's the key. You know, um, it's okay to, to approach this um, with the normal periodontal measures, but if it's not responding, that's when you've got to start thinking outside the box and take a biopsy. Uh, here's another example of a, of a patient, a young female, and she had this lesion that um, the dentist actually was suspicious because she had very good hygiene. Um, and so a lot of the times people might think of a pyogenic granuloma or some kind of reactive gingival nodule. More so here, when you start to see the ulcerative lesion here, you, you should have a higher index of suspicion that maybe something more ominous is going on. Um, but this was a biopsy-proven squamous cell carcinoma in a young patient. So, you know, remember, it's okay to scale the area, um, try and identify a local irritating factor, but if it is not resolving as you would expect a reactive condition to resolve, it should be biopsied. Um, you, don't want to you don't want to delay that for the patient's sake. Here's a more obvious squamous cell carcinoma of the gingiva, um, kind of a red and white large, I'm hoping all of you would be um, highly suspicious. Um, these are some of the patients I saw in my clinic. Uh, this patient, she had been to several clinicians um, and she was just very scared to get a biopsy. Um, eventually we did convince her to take the biopsy and that was a squamous cell. This patient, very interesting case, we took a biopsy. It was the squamous cell carcinoma. She had lymph node involvement, but when they did sample the lymph nodes, it was actually an ovarian cancer that had spread from her ovaries to her lymph nodes. So she had squamous cell and ovarian cancer simultaneously, which is really interesting. Um, so just to finish up this, this case here, um, looking at the five-year survival rates, I like showing this slide because it kind of highlights that, um, say, if you look at all stages and you look at breast cancer, we've got colorectal, melanoma, and oral and oropharyngeal squamous cell. Um, if you look at all stages, you see that, say, for example, melanoma has a, a much higher five-year survival rate overall than oropharyngeal squamous cell. Um, the reason, you know, when you when you look at the numbers, you see that the local disease, which means the primary site, regional disease is uh, lymph nodes, and distant disease is where it's metastasized. Um, the, the overall number here reflects the local disease. Um, and so that means that, you know, dermatologists and patients in general were getting these pigmented lesions removed early, and most, and, and most of these lesions are surgically cured um, at the local stage. Uh, we cannot say the same thing for oral and oral pharyngeal cancer. Closer to the regional um, five-year survival rate at 65%, and that's because by the time we find these lesions, most of the patients will have lymph node involvement. Um, and so I just like to show this because it highlights that we, we really need to do our part as, as, you know, what we can control is making sure that we're doing our exams and addressing any lesions um, that we find. And that's the only way to really increase that five-year survival rate. Okay. Um, last, last little um, bit on the squamous cell um, and leukoplakia before we move on to our next case. This is really interesting um, to me because I see a lot of gingival um, dysplasias in squamous cells. Uh, I would say anecdotally, it's almost to the point where it's similar in my region to, similar in number in my region to um, tongue squamous cells. It's definitely increased over the time I've been practicing in LA. Um, and so here is an example of a leukoplakia that's multifocal. So here we have this area here. Um, differential diagnosis. I would say a couple good, so, one thing that you would, might consider would be um, candida, okay? Uh, how we can quickly eliminate that would be to see if it wipes off. 
In this instance, it doesn't wipe off. The second differential I would consider would be something like um, gingival lichen planus, and it can look a lot like this. Uh, the thing that I notice is there's no cheek involvement. You don't always have to have cheek involvement, um, but you know it kind of fits for something reactive or autoimmune because it's multifocal. The thing that I don't like that um, doesn't quite fit for lichen planus is that it's a little bit bumpy, uh, and we call that verrucous. And so when I see that, and I see kind of multifocal areas with sharp definition, um, I'm suspicious for leukoplakia, even though it's multifocal. Um, and so we took a biopsy of this lesion. Um, here's another example of, a, of the same condition that's presenting a little bit differently. So it's a white kind of line that's, that's spreading along the gingival margin, a little bit verrucous here again. Um, you might think initially of some kind of uh, trauma, like the patient was wearing uh, bleaching trays and bleached her gingiva, um, but it's been there for several months. It's asymptomatic. Um, you know, this is another case of, of this condition, um, and here is a more advanced case of the same condition. So we're kind of going from early to medium to, to later involvement of the same condition. Um, so we've got white diffuse involvement, verrucous type appearance. It looks like it's proliferating. Um, and it's spreading all over. So this is something that we call um, proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. And um, it's something that, like I said, I'm seeing a little bit more of uh, increasing in the recent years. And I'm not quite sure. We don't know what causes it. Um, you know, we don't know uh, the etiology. We just know that it usually presents in um, elderly females or middle-aged females that don't have the high-risk behaviors or high-risk um, uh, tendencies for smoking and drinking. Um, this is that same patient where we have the white lesions that usually start for whatever reason on the buccal gingiva, go through the interdental papilla onto the lingual, and then here we have it spreading diffusely onto the buccal mucosa. So PVL, I put it as a hot topic because, again, I'm anecdotally I'm seeing more and more of this. Uh, it's multifocal. It's not typically presenting like your uh, your you know normal leukoplakia, which is usually one area. Um, here we've got it multifocal, and it is pre-malignant. So it's uh, in this stage, in the early stage, it's dysplasia, or even just hyperkeratosis. Then it goes to dysplasia, and then eventually squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so it's defined as um, having a progressive clinical course. So it starts in one area, and it spreads along. Um, and it changes over time, so it might start flat and then become bumpy, and then it has the highest potential of uh, any other condition to develop in display the cell carcinoma. And this is just kind of what I was seeing, uh, but a picture of that. We see it most commonly on the gingiva. It occurs in this unique group of patients, um, elderly or middle-aged women, who do not have the history of tobacco or alcohol use, and we don't know what it's caused by. It's not, it doesn't seem to be HPV-related or any kind of virus that we can um, identify, uh, and this is another typical example. And another example here as well. Treatment, we don't really know how to treat it, which makes it complicated. Um, you can, some clinicians will, uh, you know, remove the tissue, uh, the worst looking areas, but it tends to come back. Um, laser excision may help delay progression, but now there's even a little bit of newer literature that states that um, it actually might um, make it a, a more aggressive when it comes back. So that's controversial. Most of these patients will develop a squamous cell in, within eight years, um, and it has the highest potential for malignant transformation. So here are the secrets to success for this case. Look for white and red lesions. Um, squamous cell carcinoma has two demographics now that you need to be aware of. Older men, smokers, drinkers, and younger men, non-smokers, non-drinkers. Those would be the HPV-associated uh, squamous cells. Okay, so case number two, the next, the next, the rest of the cases don't take quite as long to get through. So case number two is a 60-year-old male. He had an implant placed in the area several, several years ago that became loose recently. That was removed. It was not painful. The patient had, you know, medical history for hypertension and a remote history of smoking. Um, so here is the example. This is the case that the patient's clinical photograph. And you can see that there's kind of like a, a granulation type tissue in the area where the implant was removed. This was the implant where you, uh, before removal where you can see that there's localized bone loss in the area. This is panoramic. So my differential diagnosis when I'm, you know, 
looking at that photograph clinically would be one of the three P's, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, pyogenic granuloma, peripheral ossifying fibroma, or peripheral giant cell granuloma. And so they just look like kind of granulomatous type lesions of the gingiva, and that's your go-to differential for lesions um, that are similar appearing to that. They're reactive. You need to biopsy them for confirmation, and excision uh, is usually curative, but sometimes they do recur if the eliciting factor is not completely removed, such as a piece of calculus or um, something uh, for some foreign material. Um, the biopsy in this instance, we can see that we have a diffuse proliferation of these um, purplish infiltrate of cells. And when we look on higher power, we actually see that these cells are highly atypical with um, you know, ringed mitoses, many different number of mitoses. And so this was actually not one of the three Ps, even though it mimicked one of those three Ps. This was the patient's um, initial diagnosis uh, of having a lung uh, cancer. So this patient's uh, was worked up, found to have lung nodules, but the initial diagnosis was based on the oral biopsy. Um, you know, it's unusual, but it does happen. Um, and I like to present this case because it mimics one of those three keys. So this was a metastatic adenocarcinoma, um, and the patient was found to have left lung um, involvement, responded to chemo, and as far as I know, the patient is alive and on maintenance chemotherapy. Um, just wanted to touch on metastatic disease to the oral cavity. Here's another example that looks similar to a pyogenic granuloma um, or one of the three Ps. You, you know, you do have to biopsy for confirmation. This happened to be a GI malignancy. This patient um, had a, a cutaneous melanoma, and so this was metastatic melanoma to the oral cavity. So um, in general, if you're going to see metastasis in the oral cavity in the soft tissue, you'll see it present like a pyogenic granuloma or something similar um, on the gingiva, but it can also present centrally as well. And the most common metastases to the oral cavity are the breast, lung, kidney, thyroid, prostate, GI tract, and skin. Um, usually you will have, depending on how advanced um, the disease is, you may or may not have pain. This patient did not present with pain, but there was bone loss and um, a swelling, associated swelling. Um, if it is central, uh, you can have pathologic fracture. Sometimes these lesions are just completely asymptomatic, like in this case. Um, and if it's going to involve the central location, it will involve usually the mandible. And something to consider is what we call numb chin syndrome. If you've got a patient that develops numbness in the mental nerve area, um, that's something that the patient needs to be worked up for. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to um, this here. I like to show this case because um, it highlights, again, kind of a benign appearing um, lesion where the clinician was, you know, considering one of the three Ps um, until they did a flap and they found a lot of bone loss. And peripheral indicates that it's not, should not have bone involvement, means it's limited to the peripheral tissues like the gingiva. So if you have a lot of bone involvement and you're thinking three Ps, probably not going to be one of those because you shouldn't have central involvement. Here you have a, a lot of bone loss. This was biopsy proven lymphoma. Um, these are examples of squamous cell carcinomas that are kind of mimicking the pyogenic granuloma. So squamous cells can mimic a lot of other things as well. Periodontal disease and pyogenic granuloma. Here are the secrets to success. Um, just keep in mind that malignancies can mimic benign lesions like those three Ps. The gingiva is the most common soft tissue site for metastatic disease and um, tends to involve these uh, primary types of malignancies. Okay, so case number three. Here we have a 60-year-old female, and she presented with intermittently painful gingiva of one-year duration. It's not uncommon for me to see these patients presenting um, you know, to my clinic with having a long history of painful gingiva and going from doctor to doctor. So, um, you know, because you see this picture and you see a lot of calculus and plaque, and you're thinking, oh, this might, this is probably just gingivitis related to um, this buildup. But actually, if you, you know, hear the patient and she's saying it's painful, potentially what has happened here is that she is too painful to brush. And so she is not brushing properly because it's too painful and that's why she's getting the buildup. So 
Um, just keep that in mind. Think outside the box if you see patients like this. Um, the differential diagnosis for this erythematous type appearing gingiva is what we call disquamative gingivitis. Um, the differential of the lesions includes erosive lichen planus, lichenoid gingivitis, which is kind of an, you know, an allergy and is mimicking lichen planus, and then the vesicular bolus diseases, so pemphigus and pemphigoid. Um, more and more, I am recommending, um, in addition to doing HME biopsies, especially if it's a biopsy of the gingiva, to also include a direct immune fluorescence um, for diagnosis because like you see here, um, this is you know the biopsy that we got. It's a good biopsy. You can see the split, but you see that there is um, you know a split with some hydropic degeneration, which we see in lichen planus, and a subbasilar split, which we see in pemphigoid. So sometimes there are overlapping features. This is pemphigoid, this is lichen planus. So you can see that there, there is a um, possibility for um, not being able to give a definitive diagnosis on H&E alone, especially if it's from the gingiva. Um, so I do like to recommend direct immune fluorescence. So your normal H&E biopsy will go in formalin and your DIF will go in the Michelle solution. You cannot put a biopsy in formalin and ask for a DIF. It has to be in Michelle solution. So you've got to be organized with that. Um, DIF is a technique where you have uh, antibodies that um, are highlighted and you use a specific fluorescent microscope to view those antibodies and depending on where they're deposited, um, it will infer the different diagnoses. So if they're deposited along the basement membrane, then it would be pemphigoid. If you have deposition throughout the epithelium, that, that indicates that the antibodies are um, reacting to desmosomes and that would be pemphigus. There's direct and indirect subtypes. Indirect just means that you're taking it from the patient's blood. Direct means that it's a biopsy. And you can't usually use, usually indirect is um, uh, limited to pemphigus, but some labs are now starting to, um, are able to do um, indirect immune fluorescence for pemphigoid as well. And this was her example, this patient. So you see linear deposition um, of IgG along the basement membrane um, and C3 here as well, which is a complement protein. And so she had mucous membrane pemphigoid. So I like to show this case because pemphigoid and the disquamative type gingivitis, they can mimic regular gingivitis, especially if it's painful for the patient and they can't brush properly. Um, it is a, pemphigoid is an autoimmune mucocutaneous condition, so it involves the skin and the um, mucous membranes, and it is chronic, so it's not something that we usually attain a cure for, it's something that waxes and wanes, usually seen in females, um, oftentimes painful, with or without vesicles, predilection for the gingiva, and you do need a biopsy to definitively diagnose that. It's important to remember that pemphigoid can affect any mucous membrane, including the eyes. And so when you have a diagnosis of pemphigoid, it's very important for these patients to be seen by ophthalmologists and treated as needed um, because it can lead to scarring and blindness if, if left untreated. Just gonna show you a couple other examples of, of uh, entities in that disquamative gingivitis rubric, so lichen planus, biopsy proven, very erythematous gingiva, and also had the nice Wickham striae. Um, one thing to remember for lichen planus is most of the times, if not all of the times, it's going to be a multifocal disease. So that's very important when you're developing a differential diagnosis to consider. Um, you know, if it's a solitary white and red lesion, probably shouldn't have lichen planus at the top of your diagnosis. If it's multifocal, then you would favor lichen planus. Um, these are disquamative type gingivitis as well. This is lichenoid gingivitis, secondary to the amalgam that's placed here, which was replaced, and then this was resolved. This is a patient that had lupus, and lupus can look a lot like disquamative gingivitis in the mouth. Um, so it's very important to include the medical history of the patient to the pathologist so we can look for very minor differences between histologically between the two because otherwise it's very easy to um, to overlook these little differences um, and as you can see here lichen planus lupus 
has a very thickened, or a slightly thickened basement membrane, and that's one of the things that we look for. So there's a lot of histologic overlap. So secrets to success here, serious conditions can masquerade as gingivitis. Um, you know, it's okay to approach the lesions initially, like they might be related to periodontal disease, but if they're not responding like you would expect, then think outside the box and either do the biopsy or refer for biopsy. Um, okay, here is case number four. We have a patient that presented to this clinician and she described a sense of fullness in the area. Um, I usually just show this picture here and try and have people consider where they would think the lesion is before showing where the lesion is. Um, I like showing this case because it's so subtle, but it also highlights the importance of having to palpate. Um, this doctor not only looked, but palpated the area and was able to feel something suddenly closely. Otherwise, it's very, very subtle. Um, and so this, this clinician, um, excellent clinician, did a biopsy. Um, your differential diagnosis here, if you think about the tissue types that are there, you definitely have salivary glands in the area. So for this location, the palate, you would include both a benign and a malignant salivary gland lesion just based on statistics um, with that location. And then, um, you know, a benign soft tissue tumor, for example. Um, we took a biopsy and this patient had an adenoid cystic adenocarcinoma. Um, so here histologically, we just see the features of this diagnosis, this kind of a Swiss cheese appearance that we like to call um, this pattern. Uh, and this is a very aggressive malignant epithelial salivary gland neoplasm. It tends to grow slowly, but it can uh, mimic ben a benign tumor clinically. Um, clinically, we see it affecting the major glands slightly more often than the minor glands, but if it's going to affect the minor glands, the hard palate is the most common site. Women uh, are affected more commonly than men, and usually middle age. Um, so here we have, the next picture is going to be a little bit um, <laughs> startling. Uh, so here was the biopsy and the patient's diagnosis, and this was for treatment. And so you can see that um, it was very serious. It was probably, um, you know, with it, maybe with even involving the maxillary sinus. Um, and so this patient has to have a wide excision because of the aggressive nature of the lesion. And now she has an obturator. And as far as I know, she's doing well. Just going to cover some salivary gland uh, tumor data. Uh, more common in women, in Caucasian women, uh, with a 2.5 uh, number of cases per 100,000 individuals. Overall, benign lesions are more common than malignant lesions. But if you, um, and if you break down by site, uh, more common in the parotid gland, and the next most common site would be um, the intraoral minor salivary glands. Remember, we have minor salivary glands everywhere in our mouth except the attached gingiva. Usually, we do not have them there. If you break down just looking at minor salivary gland tumors between benign and malignant, we've got about a 50-50 chance overall. Um, and if you, pres if you further break down by site, um, more common to have uh, malignant tumors involving the retromolar pad, the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and, and the lower lip as well. And here's a great example of something that, a lesion that might be mimicking a mucosal or um, a hemangioma, and this was a mucoepidermal carcinoma. So remember in this location, 70, if it's going to be a salivary gland tumor, 70 to 90% of the time it will be malignant based on the statistics. Here's another example of an upper lip lesion. It's kind of mimicking a benign um, submucosal mass, but this was a malignant salivary gland tumor. And then the next, um, this was an ad adin, a cynic cell adenocarcinoma, um, and it was early. And if this was a later stage, same diagnosis, but the, the lesion was not removed. Um, and so um, they can dedifferentiate and become very aggressive tumors. So secrets to success here, just wanted to highlight that, you know, look when you're doing your exams, but also feel because lesions can be subtle or deeply submucosal. We've got two cases left, and sorry, I'm going a little bit over time. Um, here we have a long-standing uh, lesion, and the patient had declined uh, surgery several times and would drain the lesion himself. So this is a central um, lesion, and 
for all intents and purposes, my differential diagnosis here would be something like um, a dentigerous cyst, so a lesion that is uh, a radiolucency surrounding the crown of an impacted tooth. And then you also want to include things like adonogenic keratocyst and maybe even um, an immunoblastoma. You can see that there's some root resorption here. Um, and it's kind of getting a little bit fuzzy at the distal aspect, um, if you look really closely. And so uh, we took a biopsy, and this, uh, here's our differential diagnosis. You could also include a glandular adonogenic cyst. These are examples of dentigerous cysts, so looking very similar. But when we looked at the histology, we saw a cystic lesion. But then when we look a little bit, it's a little bit fuzzy, but when we look a little bit closer at the histology, we're seeing islands of atypical squamous um, mucosa within the cell wall, within the cyst wall. Uh, we saw some mitotic figures and some atypical cells, and there was enough invasion that and keratin pearls that this was actually uh, diagnosed as a squamous cell carcinoma arising in a dentigerous cyst. Again, most of the time these are going to be dentigerous cysts but it's very very important to biopsy these lesions because you know every now and then you're going to get the zebra um, and this you know happened to be a squamous cell arising in a dentigerous cyst most commonly the surprises that we'll get um, mimicking a dentigerous cyst is an adonogenic keratocyst or maybe an amyloblastoma or a glandular adonogenic cyst um, so this was a very interesting case it's very rare but um, it has been reported increase increasingly reported with long-standing lesions um, this patient, remember, had a history of um, irritating the area by draining it himself over, you know, several decades. That potentially could have um, helped progress the lesion. But this is a good example of why all cystic tissue really should be, be submitted, even if it looks routine. And then our last case, we have a 55-year-old male. Um, this was an asymptomatic lesion discovered on routine exam. The clinician, excellent clinician as well, um, he did a biopsy of these lesions here because he was concerned for the white areas. The patient had a many had a heavy history of smoking, um, and there was a similar looking lesion on the soft palate. Um, so again, biopsy was taken of this area and this area. And when we looked at the histology, we were pretty floored. Um, this is what normal looks like. This is what the uh, this is the biopsy, and we can tell even not as pathologists that there's something going on at the interface um, of the epithelium and connective tissue, and there's some cells that are kind of, um, you know, spreading up towards the surface. Um, go on higher power. We can see there's a little bit of pigment, and we have, um, you know, what we call nests of cells with pigment and some atypical nuclei. And this case actually was diagnosed as a melanoma, believe it or not. Um, I'm gonna go back to the initial presentation because I just want to show you how subtle it can be. So there's definitely um, pigment here, pigment under this white lesion. We initially attributed that to smoker's melanosis. Um, but, and again, the clinician biopsied this area here and this area here because they were concerned for the white areas being dysplasia. Um, so most of the times, you know, it's not going to be something crazy, but this is a very good example as to why um, even lesions that can look benign clinically should be um, diagnosed because this clinician saved this patient's life by doing that biopsy. Um, because oral melanoma is aggressive, it's often diagnosed at a late stage. Here it was an early stage. Um, and, you know, if you see my general rule is if I see a pigmented lesion in a high-risk area, which the high-risk areas are the um, palate, maxilla, the palate and the maxillary gingiva, if I take an image, a uh, radiographic image, and I don't see amalgam in the area, I do recommend a biopsy um, because, you know, these conditions are very, very aggressive. Um, and even the early stage lesions can look very benign clinically. Um, here's a later stage lesion where the pigmented lesion is spreading already, but multifocality here in a high risk site, also an oral melanoma. This is a little bit more typical for an oral melanoma. Um, and same here. 
This is a great example of why to biopsy early stage lesions. This was a melanotic macule. This was a melanoma in situ. Same location, very similar appearance. So conclusions here, um, you know, extra oral and intra oral exam on every patient, every time. That's my rule. I know some people, you know, you're getting into your clinical practice and, and maybe it's not feasible to do that, but at least every six months. Um, look and feel. So make sure that you're doing a good thorough exam and also feeling and palpating um, because lesions can, you know, be developing deep in the submucosa. Um, serious lesions can masquerade as benign, like I showed you today. Uh, remember for differential diagnosis, think about etiology. So do you think it's reactive? If you think it's reactive, try and eliminate um, potential sources of irritation. Um, and then if it remains and it doesn't change, that's when you should biopsy. In general, we have that two week rule because the mucosa turns over in about two weeks. You should give it two, three weeks. If it hasn't changed, it should be biopsied. And remember, favor a scalpel or a punch biopsy over a brush biopsy. Brush biopsies just aren't um, very reliable in most cases in the oral cavity. Um, and that is it for today. So are we going to take questions? Yes, doctor. Uh, let me bring everyone back into the stream. Uh, I just wanted to quickly come in and uh, say that my my hats are off to you. I don't have, I'm not wearing <laughs> one, but you are an amazing professional. The amount of knowledge that you have and the way you explain it. And uh, that was uh, exhilarating because us general practitioners, a lot of times we sit there and we look at something and we don't have a clue what's going on because it's long gone from dental school. Of course. Just, uh, I just wanted to give you a, uh, give you some, uh, give you a shout out. Thank you so much. Thank for you that so one. much. Thanks for having me. And there's so many questions. I'm just gonna pick a few of them here. One of the questions they asked was the diff uh, the difference between developmental reactive and neoplastic. Okay, so that is we're talking about the etiology of a lesion. Um, they lesions can be you know tumors, which is a neoplasm. Tumors can be benign or malignant. Um, then you can also have reactive lesions. So just thinking about the etiology of reactive lesions, um, something like trauma, like you bite your lip and you get a fibroma that develops um, or a mucosal. Um, and there are other types of reactive lesions like inflammatory, infectious, so like a fungal infection or a viral infection. And then developmental, the easiest way to think about that is something like a syndrome. So sometimes in the oral cavity, you can have multifocal lesions. Um, usually it's bilaterally symmetric in younger children. And that's when you start to think about developmental conditions like a syndrome. So that, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, another question, uh, you know, as, as a general dentist, you know, I do a lot of biopsies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I'm I think one of them. <laughs> not enough, not enough, definitely. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the concern with general dentists is that they don't know how to, and they don't know, like, say, for example, if it was, a, if, if you have to, if, you know, if you have to do a complete excisional biopsy or you can do a punch biopsy. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, one of the questions here was, was asking, why do you prefer uh, uh, scalpel biopsy versus brush biopsy? So, I mean, I, I guess these questions are not really answered. So. Yeah, so, okay, so what a brush biopsy is, it's a little brush, and you basically just touch the tissue with the brush, um, and then uh, scrape it on a slide, and then you have alcohol that fixes that. And so your when you look under the microscope at that, it's just cells kind of here and there. Um, they're not, there's no orientation to each other, it's just kind of scattered cells. So you're looking at the cytology of the cells. Um, the reason why you have uh, higher false negative and or less reliability essentially is that there's a lot of source for, for user error. Um, in order to say, if you think about dysplasia, um, like I said, you have mild, moderate, severe. If you're, if you have a white lesion and you brush just the top of it, you're probably only going to get keratin, maybe a couple cells. You're not going to, if it doesn't bleed, you're not going to get the base, uh, enough sample. And so if you have say mild dysplasia, and you just brush the top of it, you're missing the atypical cells in the bottom, 
And so that would read as normal, but you didn't get the right sample. You didn't go deep enough. Even if you go deep enough and you see atypical cells, um, the diagnosis could be cellular atypia, but then you don't know if that atypia is because you have inflammation present or it's actually that the cells themselves have become dysplastic. So then you would have to do a, a scalpel biopsy anyway in order to find that out. And so in general, it's a waste of, you know, it, it's not reliable and it delays diagnosis oftentimes. Um, and it just costs the patient more money in the end because it's not, nobody's ever going to do a surgery based on a brush biopsy. It's got to be a scalpel biopsy diagnosis. Absolutely. 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 So just one last question here. So if mm -hmm. you were to, uh, uh, you know, so I, I would say like dentists are probably scared that if, if the, you know, if it's a malignant cancer and they're going to do a, a punch biopsy, they, they could be spreading it or what do you, what would you say about that? And uh is there any preferred method i mean you know scalpel would be the stand of care yeah um so that's a good question uh in general you know there is not a lot of evidence to support that you're going to spread the cancer by cutting into it um you know if it's say a metastatic disease it doesn't matter right because you've got to diagnose it anyway um even if it's a primary site um the chances of you're cutting into it, causing bleeding, and then some of those cells having the right mutations to get into that bloodstream, but they also have the right mutations to survive the bloodstream, exit the bloodstream, and then set up colony at a secondary site is so low that it's not considered to be, um, you know, something that we worry about. We have to get the diagnosis. It's kind of, you know, risk versus benefit. So, so absolutely. So go ahead and just cut the lesion out and send it in for a biopsy. Uh, uh, That's and, great. And yeah, and, and remember, um, if you have a mass, try and get the center of the mass. If you have an ulcer, try and include some periphery um, of the tissue as well. That's really important. Try and, try and think about where the best sample would be. Great, Do doctor, thank you so much. So informative. So you much information to, you know, to, to, to get all this information all at the same time. But thank you so much, we really I appreciate you. And thank you for coming on. And I know you're busy and uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend and uh, and i'm sure my, our colleagues are very excited and they, they enjoyed the lecture very much oh, well, thank, thank you. you so much for having me it's always a pleasure to see you and um, i hope you guys enjoyed that presentation thank you was, thank uh, you very much. Absolutely amazing thank you thanks